Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the first of the presentations uh, that I'm doing here at the, se at the uh, uh, Senior Center in conjunction with the Council on Aging. My name is uh, Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I work at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell is a big firm. We've got about 50, we've grown, or I think we're 54, 55 lawyers now. Uh, but I do nothing but elder law. Uh, and the presentations that I've always done here have had to do with kind of a whole variety of topics. But I, I've always said when I'm here that one of my jobs is to tell you about law, but another big piece of it is just to introduce you to a lot of players and a lot of the services that are kind of available in the community um, and other places so that you can understand them better. And, and kind of the moral of the story oftentimes at the end is go do some shopping. If you're worried about this, the best thing you can do is understand what those services are ahead of time so that you can know if, the, if something serious comes up, what the, what's, what's going to happen. So today we're talking specifically about uh, how to deal with um, someone you love uh, who may have dementia in its later stages. Now, as we've talked about, dementia isn't a disease. Dementia is a set of symptoms involving the kind of base symptoms are cognitive impairment, difficulty remembering, difficulty therefore following sets of instructions because you can't remember all of the instructions. Uh, in its later stages, difficulty getting around. In its later stages, difficulty forgetting to eat or forgetting to go to the bathroom. So we just get really, really forgetful. So the question is, we've talked here about, um, in the past, about wh how you can spot those early signs. And by the way, the reason why we typically are talking about Alzheimer's is because Alzheimer's is the cause of about 70% of the dementia in people who are over age 60. Right? There, is also, you can, there is also something called Lewy body disease. There are cardiovascular issues that can cause dementia. But really, the base is Alzheimer's disease. And the issues, no matter where the, the dementia is coming from, are really very similar issues. So the question is, so what do you do? And I know from the, in the old days, like when my mother died in a nursing home, that that's what you did. Right? In later stage dementia, you figured, oh my god, I have to go to the nursing home. There really is no choice. And that's kind of changed over time. And so that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. But we're also going to talk about nursing home care. So we're going to talk about my friends Frank and Mary. You remember them. Uh, their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. But we're only going to talk about Mary Jr. here, because in this case, Peter is living in New York. He's a big time lawyer. Paul is in San Diego. He's in high tech. Mary is the designated daughter. right? We've always talked about, typically in many families, there is the designated daughter. Occasionally the designated son, but not very often. It's usually the daughter. So we're going to talk about her relationship with all of this also. Because we're talking about Mary. We're figuring that Mary now has got dementia in its later stages, and what does she do? There are three possibilities. She, he, she can go to a nursing home. She can go to assisted living. Or she can go, or she can stay home. Now we all know that option number, number um, one is everybody's option, right? I really, really want to stay home. Um, option number three is nobody's option. I never want to go to a nursing home. Option number two is the one that you really kind of don't think about very much because you figure it's too expensive and it's not home. But we're going to talk about it because in some situations, I always tell people, I really want you to be able to stay home as long as it's safe as long as it's safe. Because you don't want to be at home, and as a result, you fall down. And you break your hip. And you all know where that goes. You know, they're just, it's an inevitable thing. Or, or you're at home, and because you're at home, you never leave home. Because you can't get out, because you've got the stairs, and you've got this and that, right? And not many people are visiting, because your spouse kind of doesn't want company, because, oh my god, you know, my spouse has got Alzheimer's. You know, what do I do, right? And so the person keeps getting more and more isolated 
um, and the caregiver gets more and more buried, and it's just bad. So we're going to talk a little bit about assisted living, because people assume that they can't afford it, and we're going to talk a little bit about the money behind assisted living. So here's Frank and Mary. Uh, they've got a house. Value is $300,000. He's got an IRA of $200,000. They've got savings of $300,000. So they have total assets of $800,000. He has income of $2,250 a month, $1,500 from Social Security, and $750 from a pension. Uh, Mary has income of $750 a month. So they've got total income of about $3,000 a month. Um, so they've been okay. You know, there's no mortgage. They've been living at home. It's been okay. So now the question is, what about, so what do they do? One possibility, of course, is the nursing home, but first we're going to talk to you about the activities of daily living. I know for people who have been here before, you've heard this term, and for people who haven't heard this term, <clears throat> you say to yourself, well, that's everything, right? That's everything I do in a day, the activities of daily living. Well, there are certain special ones. They are these, dressing, eating, toileting, bathing, transferring. Transferring means getting up out of a chair, walking across the room, sitting down. If you need physical assistance with at least two of these activities of daily living, um, or if you don't, but you need constant supervision, otherwise you're going to hurt yourself because you might kind of drift away, then you are medically eligible for um, nursing home care, but you're medically eligible for a bunch of other stuff too. So we're going to keep, you're going to hear those, that, those terms, the activities of daily living, as we go along. So, what if Mary has to go to the nursing home? Oh, groan, this is really a terrible possibility and nobody wants to do this um, because they don't want to be in a nursing home and also because Frank and Mary are thinking they don't have a tremendous amount of assets or income and what are they going to do about their assets and their income, right? So we're going to have a quick test. We can tell how many people have been before. How many people assume that in that, in that situation, you saw their situation, if Mary needs to go to a nursing home, that Frank and Mary are going to have to need to spend down quite a bit in assets before Mary can qualify for mass health. Raise your hand. Ah, well, that's good. Not too many, right? Because we understand that as long as Frank and Mary are both alive, while Mary cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets in order to qualify for mass health. And when I refer to mass health, mass health is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. MassHealth is the program that will pay for your long-term nursing home care. Medicare will pay for a handful of days if you're there to get better, but they won't pay for long-term care. So to qualify for MassHealth, Mary has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, however, can have a home as long as the equity in that home is worth less than $814,000. He can have cash or cash equivalents of $117,240, and he can have infinite income, infinite income. So in Frank and Mary's case, remember they have a home, but it's got equity of less than that number. They've got, he's got cash or cash equivalents that are worth more than that amount, right? Um, and some of it's held jointly right now. So what they need to do is, it's very straightforward, they need to transfer all their assets to Frank. This is, it, this is it can happen after Mary's in the nursing home. They can transfer all their assets to Frank. Um, and then Frank's going to have too much in assets because he has too, more than $117,240, so he needs to buy an annuity. As long, an annuity is an income stream and is not counted as an asset as long as it can't be surrendered ahead of time. The annuity, as long as it is for a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, which if Frank's about 80 years old, his life expectancy is about seven years. Um, as long as the term calls for monthly payments over a shorter period than that, then the purchase of the annuity is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream, and as we said, he can have infinite income. Therefore, the day after the assets get shifted to Frank and Frank buys the annuity, technically, Mary has less than $2,000, Frank has less than the $117,240, because he buys an annuity get, to get him below that number, and Mary can qualify for mass health. The only problem in this case, if Ma Frank and Mary's estate plan is that when Frank dies, everything goes to Mary, and that's how things are set up now, right? The house is joint, the bank accounts are joint, everything goes to Mary. If that happens and Frank dies, now Mary's got a problem, because remember, she can't have more than $2,000 in countable assets. The way that Frank remedies that is by changing his will, which he can do at any time, to say, 
If I die, I want everything to, I, Frank, want everything to go in trust for my wife. I'm going to name Mary or my other kids as the trustees of that trust. You can name anybody that you want. Give them complete discretion and they will now, if Frank then dies, that money is now all non-countable and the house is non-countable and the house doesn't get leaned and all the money can be used to provide for Mary's supplementary care until she dies and then given to the children. So there's an easy route for Frank to take to deal with Mary. Now, obviously there are issues if Frank hasn't done that planning and then he just died and then there's just Mary and so now they've got to figure out whether they, whether they want to do advanced planning, transfer assets to an irrevocable trust or give it to their children or if it's the last minute whether they want to transfer money to a so-called pooled trust and we've talked about that before. But the point is there are still options in that situation. But, it, but while Frank and Mary are both alive, the options are really good. Once Mary has qualified for MassHealth, Mary wants to do, Frank wants to do two things. First of all, he wants to visit a lot because the more Frank, because he wants to see Mary, of course, right? But also, the more Frank visits Mary, the better Mary's care is going to be. And he wants to visit, ideally, at different times of the day and different days of the week because the more it's a surprise to see you, the better the nursing home is going to be about making sure that Mary is always being taken care of. You know, you don't want them to be saying, oh, so nice to see you again, right? It's 12 o'clock, right? Mary looks great, doesn't she, you know? So you don't want that. The other thing is you want to talk to the Alzheimer's Association. Now, we've talked a lot about the Alzheimer's Association in past presentations because they are the organization that not only provides a 24-7 hotline and, and all kinds of care tips and support groups for people with Alzheimer's. They also fund a lot of the research, the goal of which is to, is to cause this dementia to be dealt with. <clears throat> when, they say, when I say dealt with, the, the, most of the research isn't around by so curing Alzheimer's, that is causing those dead brain cells in your head that have been killed as a result of the Alzheimer's to grow back. That's a big challenge. But really, the most of the research is about trying to figure out ways to slow it down, to, to try to pick up the, the, the fact that you have Alzheimer's early and find the drug regimens and the other things to try to slow it down. That has not yet happened, but that's what is being worked on. So you want to deal with the Alzheimer's Association. You want to contact them if you can. And if you've got any questions, because Mary is in this situation, you've got a loved one in this situation, um, you want to deal with that. I'm not going to go through de the details of the Alzheimer's slides. Um, now, that was possibility number one. Possibility number two is that Mary could stay home. And that's the preferred option. And the question is, but how could she do that? It's just Frank and Mary and Mary Jr. And, 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 and Mary needs like a lot of attention like a lot of attention because she's, you know, she's got, she, she's really, it's, it's, it's of concern, right? So what does she do? <clears throat> well, in that case, the organization you want to talk to right away is Bay Path Elder Services. We've, t we've had people from Bay Path here before. They are the so-called aging services access point, the ASAP, the entity that is in charge of, of basically funneling all state and federal money for elders that, that ends up in these communities, in the communities in its area. They are a nonprofit. They're not there to sell you anything. They're not there to charge you. They're there to tell you what programs are available for you. Um, and there are two big ones that would affect Mary's situation. They are the Frail Elder Waiver and the Personal Care Attendant or so-called PCA program. And I'm going to talk about one other called Caregiver Homes. <clears throat> so, uh, if, uh, yes, so if, if Mary is otherwise eligible for nursing home care, that is she needs assistance with two of the activities of daily living, um, then she's el eligible for these programs as, as long as she meets certain asset and income criteria. The income, in, in this case there is an income criterion and the income criterion is she has to be making less than $2,164 per month. But she is in this case, she's only making $750. Um, the, now, if she qualifies, though, and she's medically eligible, and you remember, how do you get medically eligible? By needing assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living. If she's eligible, 
For that, she also qualifies for these programs. Um, in the Frail Elder Waiver Program, in or, now in order to qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver Program, she has to have ass, of income of less than that amount. She has to have assets of less than $2,000. But Frank, in this case, can have unlimited assets. Frank can have unlimited assets. So in this situation, right, all that has to be done is we're going to shift all the assets to Frank. Frank's living at home with Mary. And Frank is, and so, and he can have all these assets and she can immediately qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver. And if she qualifies for that program, whatever number of hours um, the Bay Path says Mary needs in order to stay at home, that's the number of hours that, Bay, that Mass Health will pay for, right? Um, there's a se the second program is, is called the so-called PCA or Personal Care Attendant Program. That program, which runs on the same asset and income criteria, through that program, they would authorize Mary to hire whoever she wants to take care of, Fra of Mary during the times when Mary needs assistance with the activities of daily living, right? And these two programs can be blended. So she could qualify, Mary could qualify for the, the Frail Elder Waiver Program and have Bay Path hire an agency, a home care agency. And we're going to hear from, a home, from, from my friend Melissa Plud, uh, who works at a terrific home care ag agency in just a little while. So you can get a sense of what these organizations are like and what they can do. So if, if Mary qualifies for, for uh, the Frail Elder Waiver, Bay Path can hire a home care agency to provide whatever number of hours Mary needs in order to stay at home. They can also authorize Mary uh, to hire somebody to help her specifically with the activities of daily living. And that person, that doesn't have to be an agency, that can be an individual. That can be Mary Jr. She can hire her daughter to help her with the activities of daily living. And they'll pay the daughter, right? Or she can participate in something called Caregiver Homes, which is a program through which if, if Mary Jr. is living there, they will pay her a stipend to basically be the foster child taking care of the foster parent as opposed to the usual foster care where the parent's taking care of a little kid. That's why it's called adult foster care, right? So there are several programs that will allow Mary to stay at home with Frank there, right? But what if Frank dies? Oh, well, if Frank dies, remember, and all the assets go to Mary, this all blows up because Mary has too much in assets. That's why, once again, Frank would want to change his will so, to make, so as to make sure that if he died, Mary Jr. or one of the other children's acting as a trustee was going to be able to manage whatever assets they had for Mary's benefit for the rest of her life. Because it may be, if, he's got, if Mary Jr. is willing to spend the time doing it, that Frank could, or that, that Mary Sr. in that case could stay at home still. There might be enough be, between the, the, the care that, that, the, that, the, that Bay Path is going to buy and the care being provided by the daughter to allow the mother to stay at home. So there were real options in that case. And once again, we're going to hear about a little, a little bit more about what home care can provide. And I'm just going to mention one other thing. In, in all of these cases, remember, at that point, they have extra assets. Frank and Mary have extra assets, which at this point has, they, is available. So to the extent that all these other programs aren't providing enough in care, They've got $300,000, $400,000 to supplement that. That's very different from most people, they start thinking about trying to keep their, you know, their loved one at home and they go, oh, this is going to be impossible. I can't afford to pay for 24-hour care, right? And you can't. I mean, it costs a huge amount. Nursing homes are cheaper than 24-hour care, right? But if all you're doing is supplementing all these other things that Mass Health is providing, there may very well be a way, a way to do it. Finally, <clears throat> there is the third alternative. Assisted living. Not any assisted living, because at this point, Mary has a lot of needs. You can't be in an assisted living facility where you're living independently and, and, and really there are no services that are available because Mary just isn't in that situation right now. She really needs some help, right? But what about those assisted living facilities that have memory care units? And I think, and that's what I invited uh, my friend Trish Pope to come over and talk to you about. Because the, the, the salmon system, 
uh, which has the Beaumont Nursing Homes and Whitney Place, the Whitney Places, right? Whitney Place, the, the, the Whitney Place increasingly, their locations have a memory care unit. What is a memory care unit? Well, really, that's what Trish is going to talk to you about. But, but the, 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 the thing to think about Go back to that situation where, where Frank and Mary are trying to decide, do we want to stay at home or do we want to do this, right? And if we're going to do this, it's going to be a big move. We're going to have to move out of our house. We have to do all of this stuff, right? So you know, is, is that really what we want to do? Well, to the extent that Mary needs, not only needs a safe environment, an environment where she's not going to fall and where she can actually go to the bathroom and get up off the toilet, you know, and be able to take a shower, and where there are going to be a set of people who get what it is to have dementia and what it is to interact with folks about to, about, that have dementia. That memory care and assisted living could be the best alternative. One of the things I have come to appreciate during the last, since doing this stuff, which has now been forever, 25 years, like a long time, I always thought that the symptoms of dementia, they were just all one big pile. You know, there's the cognitive loss and the not being able to do the skills and there's some difficulties roaming. And then there's all of these others. There's depression and anger and apathy and just feeling terrible about yourself. About yourself. The depression really just the killer. And the anger and the other things are really the expressions in many cases of that depression. I have really come to believe those do not have to go together, right? That you can get, there's no way around the memory loss and the other issue. The brain cells that used to do that stuff just aren't working, right? But if you have a set of people that you're with and interacting with who know how to deal with that, right, then you can have at the end of the day, because every day is it's about one day at a time, right? At the end of the day, you can have a happy day. It isn't a happy day where you're doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. That's out of the question, right? But I mean, I can't do that now, you know? So there are a whole bunch of things that if you can let it go and say, that's not my identity, that little being able to do that particular task is not me, there's, there's a lot more of me than that, right? Then you can live a really happy life. And what's, what's so wonderful to me about What's, how, the, how the assisted livings have evolved, the memory cares have evolved, is you've got people that are not, have now got the training as well as the, the, the interest to do that stuff. So, Trish Pope, tell us a little bit about the memory care unit. We're going to talk about money a little bit later on. Hi, folks. I'm from Salmon Health and Retirement, um, Whitney Place Assisted Living Residence, Beaumont Skilled Nursing, and we also have adult day health programs. Um, memory care programs are something that we're very good at because we get it. We understand um, sometimes it's just not for you to keep your person at home. Um, the days are long. No matter how much care you put in, it's overwhelming for you. And sometimes you just need some other folks that are there to help you out. And that's what we do with memory care programs. Because people that work in memory care programs, they do get it. They're trained to be there. They're trained to anticipate needs of folks because sometimes our verbal skills just aren't what they used to be. Um, we all have the right to be happy. At the end of the day, that's all we ever want for anybody. And sometimes being happy not only for you, but for the person that you love most in the world might be the fact that it's no longer feasible for you to live together. But sometimes you might need to separate so that you can continue to be happy. What happens when you move to a memory care program? Well, we do the heavy lifting and you're still the family. So we're not taking anything away from you, but we're there to help you so that your days can be more enjoyable. Because let's face it, that's what we all want. We have wonderful programs that include family members as well as our residents. We have adult day programs where sometimes you just need that break. So maybe two days a week, your loved one can go to a adult day health program where they're going to have socialization um, recreational activities that are geared for them to succeed because nobody, none of us now, want to fail. Why would we want to fail when we're a little bit memory impaired? We all want to succeed in what we're doing. So that's what all of these programs are designed to do. We want people to be happy. We want you to be happy. Everybody has the right 
to have a good day. Um, we are there to help you, uh, your medication needs, perhaps some help with bathing and dressing, even in adult day health, and a lot of people don't know that. You can have your, um, your showers at your adult day health. If it's easier, your home is not conducive, and you're springing somebody to adult day health a couple of days a week, they can have their showers there. There's folks there that are trained to help them do that. And we're, we're, we're not taking the tools out of your hands. We're doing the heavy lifting, and we're letting you still remain to be a family. And that's really what happens at the end of the day. We certainly understand in all memory programs, no matter where you choose to go, we understand that it's an awesome responsibility. You're bringing us the person you love most in the world, and you're leaving that person with virtual strangers. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. We're here to guide you through that and to become your friends, and a little bit to become part of your family, so that you don't feel so all alone. Memory impairment is a horrible disease, um, but it doesn't have to be miserable every single day. There's a lot of joy left for folks. There's a lot of wonderful things, a lot of attainable things for people to do, and that's what memory programs are geared for. People that work in, mem in memory programs, they get it. They do it every single day. They're there not because the pay is great. They're there because that's where they want to be. That's what they're good at, and they take pride in making a difference in people's lives every single day. So that's what we do in memory care programs. We're there to anticipate needs. If, um, if Frank, uh, Mary, I'm sorry, we're talking about Mary. Mary gets up at 3 a.m. every day um, and she wants a snack. There's somebody there to have a snack with her. It might be Mary and it might be a PCA and it might be Sally and it might be Nancy. There are people there, they're awake, they're there to anticipate needs, they're there to make you feel as though whatever point of the day you're at, it's okay and we can help you through it, and we can help you deal through it. We also are there to anticipate needs. I spoke about that earlier. Um, currently in our memory care program, we have a couple of nurses who were night shift nurses. So they're up at night. Not because they're, um, their time is all scrammed up and they can't figure it out. It's because they're used to getting up at night. Well, you know what? We have tasks that need to be done. So if they're up at night and they need to clock in for a little while and do a little bit of work, we can help them do that. There's plenty of little things for them to do. But it makes them feel as though they're part. It makes them feel as though they're participating. And it makes them feel as though they're giving back. And that's what's important. Because just because we're memory impaired doesn't mean that we should lose our sense of identity. Oh, that's mine. It's just that I wanted to use their rabbit slug. The bunny. Right. <laughs> One of the things that they do, I mean, they're, they're, they're looking for, to have interactions all the time. This was, this, the person who runs all their memory care units is a guy named, is it Gary Davis? Gary, Gary Davis. Davis, who, who had, had talked about the fact that they, you know, they, they're, they're bringing in things to, to create live experiences, that they're, they're doing group activities regularly. Um, they're doing a lot of art stuff, right? Because one of the things that they find, or that we found with Alzheimer's, is that while cognitive issues um, do go, right, because of those brain cells that are dying, that there are a jillion brain cells that remain, among other typically things that have to do with art and music and the outdoors and all these things are really activities that remain, right? So to be doing those kinds of activities can give people a really positive sense of fulfillment. So pretend that that memory care unit is going to cost what you think of as a lot. Say it's $6,000 a month. Say it's a lot. Right? And, let's go, and I'm going to go back to Frank and Mary's slide. Right? And Frank and Mary only make $3,000 a month. And they're saying to themselves, oh my God, what am I going to do? Right? That's an extra $3,000 a month that I'm going to supposed, supposed to be able to afford. Right? Well, a couple of things. I just want to mention a couple of things. It's really important. First of all, remember when you go to assisted living, most of your other expenses go away. Right? You're not maintaining the house now. You're not eating at home. You may still be driving, but you're not driving as much, right? There are a whole set of things that just go away, right? And so your, your kind of total cost of living is really much smaller. Second, <clears throat> if you require assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, then, first of all, if Frank or Mary was a veteran who served at least one day during a period of war, and I'm not going to go into detail about that today. We've talked about this. We'll be glad to talk about it later. 
Then, and if, and if the services being provided to Mary are part of a bundled package, like the tapestry program, right, then the whole payment to the assisted living facility is considered to be income to that family for VA purposes. The reason why I say that is there is a benefit called the aid and attendance benefit, um, which, through which the VA will pay if Frank were the one with dementia, as much as about $2,000 per month um, to an assisted living facility that is providing those kinds of bundled services. So in this situation, if it were Frank that had dementia, instead of needing, well, $6,000 a month minus the $3,000 that they have in income, he'd really only need $4,000 a month minus the $3,000 they have in income because they'd be getting a benefit of $2,000 a month. If, if it's Mary, if I recall correctly, the benefit is about $1,200 a month. It is in that order of magnitude. So it's a substantial benefit. Second, uh, if a healthcare professional certifies that Mary needs assistance with to what? Two of the activities of daily living, then all of the payments that are being made to the assisted living facility, if the services are bundled, are tax deductible. They are a medical deduction. Well, you'd say to yourself, well, why would Frank and Mary care about that? They don't have that much income. The, the benefit of a, of a deduction is that you get to reduce the taxes you're paying because you're reducing the amount of income on which you have to pay taxes. So if Frank and Mary were paying, well, what's $6,000 a month times 12, $72,000 a year uh, to the assisted living facility, that would be a medical deduction of $72,000 potentially, right? Well, how can they benefit? Well, they really can't. But suppose Frank and Mary took that cash that they had, right, or sold the house and took the proceeds from that cash and gave it to one of the kids, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. Now, of course, you wouldn't do this unless you trust your kids, right? But if you did, right, so take, take Peter. Remember I mentioned to you, Peter is a, is a well-to-do lawyer. He's practicing in New York City where the effective total income tax rate on high brackets is about 40% because there's a federal tax, there's a New York tax, there's a New York City tax, right? So every dollar that he can save in terms of a medical deduction saves him 40 cents off of his taxes. So if he can pick up a medical deduction of $72,000, he's gonna save about $30,000 a year from his taxes. Now, if he's a nice son and decides that rather than just spending that money and going to on vacation, he puts it aside into the pot for his parents. What he's effectively done is he's extended his parents' money by 40%, by a gigantic amount, right? Which means that effectively, guaranteed Frank and Mary could live in assisted living like happily ever after, like for the rest of their lives. In this situation, they have enough in assets to stay in assisted living for 20 years, 25 years, if they use some of these options. So I'm just saying these are like real possibilities. So finally, so there are financial issues with home care and bringing people in. And although we've talked about the fact that some of these programs you can actually hire your own child, right? But what about these, all of these agencies, right? My, my, Mary would never let any stranger come into her house. Have you heard this before, right? They would ne never, would there be a stranger in my house? And what would they be doing exactly? They'd be just like hanging around there all the time. What would they be doing in my house? Well, Melissa Plud uh, works for Care Solutions, which is one of the larger, um, really kind of combination nursing and home care agencies in this area. And I wanted to have her talk to you about the kinds of services that could be provided and how that would all work, just so that you understand the possibilities. Because as we've talked about, the financing can be dealt with. Right? In Frank and Mary's case, the financing can be dealt with. So the question is, when you're trying to balance out, should we be trying to stay at home? Do we want to try it assisted living or do we need nursing home care? Is this viable? Thanks, everybody. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to quickly mention is I do have a couple of flyers about the aid and attendance benefit if anyone's interested afterwards. And I also have a brochure that's produced by the Home Care Aid Council of Massachusetts, which talks about how to hire a home care provider. Um, because Arthur made some really important points where people are saying, who is this person in my home? Um, what are they going to do? 
And when you are with a bona fide agency that does everything above board and has standards up to here, um, what we do is we do the criminal background check and we do the reference checks and we do a 75 question competency exam and we go on and on and on. The officer inspected general to check for fraud against their license. We do the nurse registry. We do all these things. And at the end of the day, I meet with them for five hours and we do an orientation type of thing. And then I ask myself, would I let this person take care of my grandmother? She's 93 years old. And if, if I have any reason to think no, then I won't hire them. What's really funny, though, is last week I was telling a prospective client's daughter this, and she said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you like your grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was rather humorous. And I, I love, I adore my grandmother. So not anybody could just go to her home and take care of her, I'll tell you that. What we also do is, I'm a social worker, we also have several nurses that work for our agency, is that everybody gets an individualized plan of care. Because there's so many variances with cognition and behavior and different things like that with people who have dementia, it's not cookie cutter. So everybody is different and everyone's gonna have different needs. So it's very important. Trish and Arthur had both touched upon how important it is to focus on that particular person's preferences. The Alzheimer's Association calls it purposeful engagement. So for some, you know, for the night nurse, you know, the, the nurse that worked nights all the time, maybe at 3 a.m., you put some papers on the desk and it gives them purpose. They feel like they're doing something like they did in their job. Are you gonna give a farmer something like that who is, so you get the, you get the history from people. What did they like? What did they not like? That way you can really personalize and individualize a care plan for that person. So, um, for example, we have one gentleman who just absolutely refused to go to the dining room when it was time to eat. Did not want to do it. Finally, some, <laughs> just one day, um, one, of the, um, one of the nurses in the facility got some information and it turns out that he was a colonel in the army and she walked up to him and she said, sir, you're wanted in the dining room, sir. And you know what? He got up and he went to the dining room. And those kind of things are so important and that's what we call the personalized you know, care plan because that technique is not gonna work for somebody else, right? But, um, so we don't wanna just give what, busy work, you know, to keep the hands busy just to do something. But you know what, if it was a lovely lady that was a housewife or raised four children and it gives her comfort and peace to fold washcloths and fold towels, then we give her a rummage bin, you know, of clothes that she can dump out and fold, you know, things like that. So just to talk about the individualization of it, it's very, very important. Um, that's me. So the customized care based on the client's needs and goals. I just really just talked about that, how that important that is. With private home care, um, we have two sides of what we do. And one is called certified or skilled, and many of you are familiar with the term VNA. Those services are covered by insurance. They're covered by Medicare or private insurance companies. And what that typically means is if you have what they call a skilled need, for example, you're coming out of the hospital and you need a visiting nurse to change a wound or assist or a physical therapist to assist with what's happening at home or an occupational therapist, the insurance company will cover that. And in fact, they will cover even a home health aid to help with showers a couple times a week. But with that being said, just like Medicare paying for a nursing home, it's a short-term benefit. Once they see you're at your baseline, then it's converted to what they call custodial care, where it's just your daily care that you need. It's not gonna get any better than that. And that's when Medicare will pull out and say, well, we're not gonna pay for ongoing care for that. Um, and that's where other payer sources come in after that. So sometimes what we like to do is all of these benefits they're talking about, from adult day health to, um, you know, having an aid come at night to having insurance covered aid. By putting all these different programs together, it really gives you some nice options in order to stay at home. So the other part of it too is, you know, with private home care, if you call us and you're paying out of pocket for care and you say, I want somebody at my house Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., then we have somebody at your house Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m.
But if you have home care that's governed by the insurance company, they might call you that morning and say, oh, I'll be there at 3, or I'll be, so they, you can't really select. They try to be consistent with timing and things like that. But when you're privately paying, you have more control over what you want done. So what do you do during that time? My goodness, uh, this person needs eight hours of supervision a day. Are they going to sit there and stare at me for eight hours? There are a lot of things people can do in home care, but that purposeful engagement is very important. Um, I'm not going to get too into it for now, but I'm a certified Ageless Grace educator, and what that is is the chair exercise mind-body experience. And Arthur touched upon it because what he talked about is that even in advanced dementia, there are a lot of skills that you don't forget. So you could be, um, they might not, they might call their son their husband, for example. Or you might have somebody that um, can't remember a lot of what's currently going on, but if you sing Pop Goes the Weasel, they'll know all the words. If you tell them, can you tell me, if you were playing baseball, how would you throw a ball? You know what? They'll do it. These, you know, neuroplasticity is what they call it, um, stay. There are certain things that remain from your childhood. They might not know the dog they've had for the last 20 years, but they might remember their childhood dog. So things like that. So really, it's very, very individualized. So what we do is incorporate that person's wants and needs and, and things that are enjoyable to them into the care plan. So that's what we'd be doing to fill the time. On top of the fact that we could be doing laundry and emptying the trash and making the bed and doing light housekeeping, going to the grocery store, picking up the prescriptions, taking someone out to lunch. You know, having that socialization is also very important. So, so paying for private home care, um, Arthur already talked about a lot of these options. The Mass Home Care Program goes through the ASAPs, the one in this area being Bay Path that he spoke about. If you are income eligible in medically, Medicaid Clinical for Nursing Home, the 2ADL, the Activities of Daily Living, um, you could be eligible for private home care. So we have contracts with these agencies, these ASAP agencies, the Aging Service Access Points. So somebody might be clinically and financially eligible for some funding for home health aides, and then we get called in to provide that care and then it gets paid through the mass home care programs. Long-term care insurance, as the longer I stay in this field, the more and more I start to come across this. It's really, like, I, I think it hasn't really been too, you know, publicized for, until like the last five, 10 years, really. Um, so more and more people are very, very young and are able to get good policies now because they're hearing about it for the first time. So your policy might say um, you get reimbursement of $150 a day. That's your policy. It could go towards an assisted living. It could go towards home care, anywhere that's documented need for those ADLs, those activities of daily living. Veterans Aid and Attendance they've talked about, personal funds and assets. That's the primary payer source for private home care um, because the insurance covers this much, but you need this much. Right? So, and Arthur mentioned something that, um, that, you know, private home care is very expensive and to have 24-hour care in your home, it's extremely costly. And I'm not going to say it's not, but with that being said, I have many, many, many clients that are eligible for a 24-hour live-in caregiver, and that does cost less per day than a nursing home bed. And people are like, you're saying I could have one person, one-on-one, -on -one, in my own home, and if you have any money at all above $2,000, you're paying for a nursing home bed anyway. And to have that as an option, it's a nice option for some people. There are some little nuances about it that's going to make it work if the person's sleeping at night and things like that, but that could be discussed individually. Um, and then as we talked about, the Medicare will only pay for what they call the skilled need, and that's the VNA, nursing, PT, OT, speech, home health aid, sometimes a medical social worker can get covered too if that person needs assistance with forms and sorting things out and getting all this stuff together, the group adult foster care and the adult day health and things like that. And then the Medicaid, that's typically going through the ASAP programs for, for mass health reimbursement. So questions to ask when you're hiring an agency, and again, I, I have brochures from the Home Care Aid Council that kind of puts that on paper. Some people are like, well, home care companies cost a lot of money, can't I just put an ad in Craigslist? You could, but as a normal citizen, you don't have the privilege to do criminal background checks. Not everybody can do that. 
Um, so you're thinking of what if they get into an accident in your home? Do you have workman's comp insurance? Are you paying their payroll taxes or are you paying them under the table? If you're paying them under the table and they hurt themselves, what's going to happen then? God forbid, but what happens if they hurt your loved one? Where's the insurance behind that? So those are some questions that you definitely want to ask yourself. You know, who's paying the payroll taxes? Who's paying the workman's comp? Are they insured? Are they bonded? Do they have these policies? And, you know, all uh, the T's crossed and the I's dotted, as they say, you know? So those are the important things that you want to look for. And like Arthur said, you want to shop around because not every agency or every assisted living is for every person. So I encourage people to shop around. I'm happy to meet with anybody anytime, but are you meeting with other people too? Do you want to find the right match for you? Um, that 24-hour oversight is very important. As the um, private pay division manager, um, it's very important to me to do unannounced supervisory visits in the home. I always tell the families this. Anytime my aide is in the home, I can come. I can stop in anytime. How does the client look? Is it safe? Is the environment clean? How would they, how's their rapport with each other? How's that going? Are they following the plan of care? Are they, have there been changes? Do things need to be updated? Do they need more equipment in the house? All those things. Um, very sad. I mean, a, a lot of folks that I've worked with, I also worked in hospice for many years, and I did some groups um, with Arthur talking about hospice services. Um, but I'll just simply say with home care, I had an aide call, uh, it was maybe a month ago, the aide called and she said, I don't think she's doing too well talking about her client. Is there any chance you could stop by maybe next week or something to check in on her? And I said, you know what, I'm going to be in the area this afternoon. I'm going to come by this afternoon. And I get there and I see that the client is actually actively dying. And nobody was able to identify that because they didn't know. They didn't know what that looked like. And within 24 hours, I made the referral. I talked to the husband. I talked to the doctor. We got it in. Hospice was in the house within a day. And she died five days later. So if I didn't come for that till that next week, she could have died in pain or not being well cared for and not having that benefit. So the importance of a home health care agency's oversight and supervision is huge to provide that quality care. So that's a question that might not be on any brochure, but you might want to ask. How often does the supervisor come to my house? And then what do they do then? You know, so those are some other questions you might want to ask. So the caregiver supervision, but also the care management. We are available 24 hours a day if you have a need. You know, I've had tons of calls at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday at that, right? Um, I need a caregiver. They're telling me at the hospital that my mom's going home today. We didn't know this. It's now 4. I need a caregiver at my house at 6 o'clock then let's do it. You know, you have that flexibility. Um, so, I mean, I think that's it. If anybody has any questions about home care, do you want to do questions at the end? Any questions questions right at there. the end? Very close. Okay. Very close. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Melissa, thank you. Just a couple of comments on what Melissa said. First of all, you should be aware that if you do have long-term care insurance, that's, to me, one of the most valuable things about long-term care insurance right now. Uh, I'm not crazy about long-term care insurance in terms of paying for nursing homes because typically it doesn't. It doesn't provide enough, enough money. But it does really pretty effectively deal with these kinds of issues. So you may already have this taken care of. Second, especially if you're staying home and you're trying to figure out that plan, I cannot emphasize enough this whole training issue, right? Uh, just going back to what Trish was talking about, having people who, are, who understand what dementia is about and what the hot buttons are, and what the conversation needs to be with the person you're dealing with who has dementia is really, really important. This is, you're not simply hiring somebody to wash the dishes, right? This is someone, because the whole point of this is not to keep your loved one at home no matter what, but to keep your loved one at home so they can be happy at home. So it's really, really important. Also, I should mention, I know that at Whitney Place now, they also have they, they're, they're developing support groups and, and training for relatives, right? For, you know, for friends and parents and ki or for love, you know, spouses, kids, people who are taking care of people who have dementia. So that you yourself and your family members can be able to understand how to treat dad or how to treat uncle so-and-so, you know? I mean, you know you love them, but that is a difference between that and knowing really how to interact with folks. I'm just going to use one other, to mention one other thing. 
in terms of those individualized care plans, one of the, um, one of the, 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 uh, the slides that, that, that uh, Trisha's boss uses, or Tr I shouldn't say, not Trisha's boss, that the guy who runs the memory care units uses, uh, is a slide of a woman doing a crossword puzzle. And they point, he points, out to the, points to the fact they do a crossword puzzle with this woman every day at 2.30. And the reason for that is that prior to that, she would always, she was in a memory care unit, and she would always get up at 2.30 to go to the bus stop to go get her kids. Now, of course, her youngest child now is 45, right? But that was what she always did, was get up and go to the bus stop. So they always start the crossword puzzle, I shouldn't say at two, before 2.30, so that she's very engaged and loves the crossword puzzle at 2.30 so she doesn't go to the bus stop. I mean, that's really developing individual, and that's something that could be done at home with home care workers. Having a person who understands how to develop that kind of plan of care is just really, really important. So, you've seen this before, the goal of all life is to sleep well at night as you're getting older, right? We're not trying to make a billion dollars, right? We're trying to sleep well at night, live well until we die. So this may be relevant to you or not, you know, you can decide that. Um, remember that if you want to see this presentation again or if you know somebody who you think should see it, we upload all of these to, our, to my YouTube channel. Um, and, and it, of course, gets showed locally on Marlboro Cable and we really appreciate the interest of Marlboro Cable in viewing these. Uh, and finally, uh, Frank and Mary are, do have a team in this year's Alzheimer's Association annual walk on, on uh, Sunday, January, or excuse me, Sunday, September the 28th. Let me know if you'd like to join Frank and Mary's team. You get a t-shirt. Thank you very much. Any questions for any of my guests? Yes, sir. What was the income qualification level again? For the Frail Elder Waiver, $2,164 per month. Now, Frank, in this case, Frank's income was higher than that. That does not mean that Frank cannot qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver. What it means is, if he's above that amount in income, uh, he also needs to be paying a contribution. There's, a, there's basically a deductible that he needs to pay in order to qualify for the rest of the care. It's a big deductible. In Frank's case, if he, if he earns $2,250 a month, and he is over income. Basically, his deductible is that $2,250 minus, I want to say, $1,273, if I recall correctly. You may not know that number. So his deductible is going to be about $1,000 a month. So that wouldn't make sense if Mary had early stage Alzheimer's. But if Mary had early stage Alzheimer's, they wouldn't be talking about these programs, right? So the, the, the number of hours of home care that would be bought with $1,000 a month is not a, like a gigantic number of hours. So that for a person like in, Frank and Mary's, or in Frank's or Mary's situation that needs a lot of hours, what this effectively means is there's a cap on the amount of home care that the family is going to need to buy. And it's the difference between the, the income of the person who needs it and about $1,273. Beyond that amount, Everything else is going to get picked up by Mass Health, right? So it always makes sense. Now, once again, one of the goals here is not to, tell, to have you leave this room and have all the answers to all these programs. It's to know Trish, right? And it's to know Melissa. And it's to know you want to see these places and, be, and don't disqualify yourselves for these programs. Do the math and find out whether you qualify for this stuff and find out if if it all things said and done, you know, your Frank or your Mary is going to be a lot happier, right? Maybe not at home, but in a place that's kind of like home, right? Or that they're going to be a lot happier with home care workers coming in who actually know about dementia, right? They're not just nice people who know how to do the dishes, but they're people who know about dementia. Any other questions? Any other questions? If not, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Oh, can I have a quick round of applause for my, my uh, wonderful guests? Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.